a symbol of Victorian engineering. Small in size, a sharp bark and surprising bite, their history is one of the longest of any standard gauge design. For several reasons, the name William Stroudley is synonymous with the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway. Introducing a yellow shade of green, updating Brighton works to really put it on the map, and introducing these, the A1060 tanks. 50 of them were built between 1872 and 1880. Designed for outer London commuter trains, they could accelerate rapidly between frequent stops. But it was their nickname, Terriers, that idolised them so, thanks to the sharp barking noise produced from the exhaust. It's a shame it didn't catch on with others, really. But the noise is far from the point with this class. Stroudley drew inspiration from an engine he rebuilt for the Highland Railway in 1869, and first impressions make you realise just how small these things are, with a low-slung boiler, raised buffers, and a squat cab. The boiler pressure was just 140 psi. The wheels were just under four feet, and the coal capacity barely half a tonne. The result was a nippy 26-ton machine with a tractive effort of over 7,650 pounds. Doesn't sound like much, but you'll be surprised at the advantages. The first six engines were introduced on the eight and a half mile stretch between London Bridge and London Victoria, and over the course of 10 months, they consumed 1,163 fewer tons of coal than their predecessors. Furthermore, Stroudley's policy of standardisation seemed to be paying dividends, as repair costs on these engines were barely down to 0.052 pence per train mile. So, cheap to run. But were they effective? The figures speak for themselves. The South London line allowed a 35-minute run each way with 11 stops and the 1 in 64 of Grosvenor Bank didn't help matters. However, the Terriers managed to rack up 4,318 miles across 250 trips a week. Then there was work on the East London run. The Terriers managed 16 minutes to undertake three stops between Newcross and Shoreditch, including steep climbs on either side of Brunel's Thames Tunnel. But the greatest achievement for these engines came in the spring of 1878, when number 40 Brighton was displayed at the Paris International Exhibition that year, for which Stroudley earned a gold medal for his workmanship. The same engine then achieved speeds of 50 miles an hour on the run from Paris to Dieppe, a record previously unheard of on this line. Just shows who knows what, doesn't it? Oddly enough, these engines were also copied by, of all people, the Australians. In 1875, the New South Wales Government Railways constructed eight 060 tanks for similar duties to the Brighton Originals. Their cabs and bunkers may have been bigger, but in every other respect, they were just about the same. They didn't serve their time very well though, all being cut up by the 1930s. Meanwhile, the Terriers themselves were in for an upgrade. 21 of them were rebuilt between 1911 and 1943, with slightly bigger boilers, slightly smaller cylinders, and slightly bigger driving wheels. Couple this with a double coal capacity, and you get the A1X, a 28-ton machine with a tractive effort increased to 10,695 pounds. Sadly, the growth of suburbia was due to miss out on these upgrades. As early as 1873, bigger, more powerful machines were already displacing the Terriers. Some had been withdrawn by the early 1900s, with the rest of them finding a new lease of life elsewhere. Eight of them went to the Isle of Wight network, where they ran with coaches nearly as old as them. Two were sold to the Kent and East Sussex Railway in Tenterden, where they worked turn and turn about with other second-hand pre-grouping machines. 
Others found work in a smattering of places, including the Admiralty, various light railways and construction work. One was eventually reserved to become the shunter at Brighton Works. But the most famous place to find these engines was on the four and a half mile branch serving Hailing Island in Hampshire. This railway needed engines light enough to traverse the long wooden viaducts crossing the harbour here at Langston. And in terms of power and weight combined, the Terriers were the only engines in southern England that fitted the bill. Hailing Island became an ideal stamping ground for these engines from 1889, keeping busy with as many as 24 return trips a day. They also gained a cult following with enthusiasts, often running rail tours along branches in the famous top and tail formation. So, it seems that Stroudley was onto a winner. Unfortunately, there were a couple of concerns. Alarmingly, when these locomotives came out, they were initially fitted with brake blocks made from wood. Now, OK, in the early days of loco technology, this was common practice, along with skyscraper chimneys and manual sanding gear. But you've got to remember, these engines had to frequently stop trains weighing 120 tonnes. And we all know the story of the engine with wooden brakes. They were thankfully upgraded later on with iron brake blocks, but this didn't prevent other issues. Terriers may have been powerful for their size, but their use was still limited. Hailing Island proved that on the flats, they could take up to four bogey coaches unassisted, but the Rother Valley line proved they would have to double up for more than two. Then there was coal capacity, which, even when doubled, was restrictive. The Isle of Wight engines needed extended bunkers, as coaling points were only in three locations. But the biggest problem with these engines, by far, was the cab. When it was designed, there really was no consideration made for driver and fireman's comforts. I mean, you could get four, possibly five people on this cab at a push, but even with two people, you would barely be able to swing a mouse in here, let alone a shovel. And look at the position of that firehole door. It couldn't be any lower if it was on a traction engine, so constant firing would always be a continuous, back-breaking struggle. Some people say it was more effective to kick the coal and lump by lump. As the old Highland prototype had been designed for one-man operation, it's easy to see why these engines were so awkward to fire. But, awkward as they might be, the surviving Terriers carried on. And by the 1960s, number 72 Fenchurch became the oldest working locomotive under BR ownership. But, like the dinosaurs, they couldn't last forever. By 1949, the Isle of Wight network had replaced their terriers with the ex-London and South Western Adams O2 tanks, which were bigger, more powerful, and nicer to drive. The Kent and East Sussex lost its passenger service by 1954, with goods trickling on for another seven years. Others gradually followed suit, until the only place these engines could be seen hard at work was Hailing Island. This too ceased to be in November 1963. 50 Terriers were built, 10 survive, one exported to Canada, one saved for the National Collection, and the rest finding a third lease of life on various private railways. Take this one for example. When withdrawn, number 46 Newington was laid to rest outside a pub on Hailing Island. In 1979, she was rescued by the White Locomotive Society and moved to Haven Street for restoration, as number W8 Freshwater. In 1998, the Isle of Wight Steam Railway showed their dedication to keeping this engine running by fitting her with a brand new £35,000 boiler, overcoming what was once deemed impossible. And Freshwater is not the only one that deserves mention. Built as number 70 Poplar, this engine spent most of her life on the Kent and East Sussex line as their number 3 Bodium, being transferred briefly to Hailing Island before withdrawal and preservation. She's one of the oldest survivors of the class, 
and as another terrier to receive a new boiler, looks set to run for many generations to come. But you can't review the terriers without mentioning this one. Preserved in 1960, number 55 was idolised three years later by the Reverend W. Audrey as Stepney the Bluebell engine in the famous Railway Series books. Since that time, the engine has been worked continuously over the years. So much so, demand has resulted in the manufacture of patterns to cast new cylinders for Stepney and other terriers. Another feat that preservationists would have written off back in the 60s. Which brings me on to the number of survivors. How have these engines found a new use in recent years? In the early days of preservation, enthusiasts would snatch up anything they could get their hands on. So perhaps it's more through luck than anything else that so many of these engines survive. But even if they can't do much, some railways can still put them to frequent use on lightweight vintage trains. Even the Bluebell, for all their size and demand, find these engines more economical to run than machines four times their size. And with the price of coal going up, who could blame them? So really, if history is anything to go by, these engines could always find themselves useful. And not just for show. To sum up then, the Terriers were not everyone's cup of tea. Their tiny cabs entailed awkward firing that was enough to break anyone's back, and their tiny size could always limit their use. But size can be a blessing as well as a curse. With enough survivors to contemplate the mass production of spare parts at a lower price, they are one of the few classes that could be kept going indefinitely. Few engines have kept going as long as they have. The old saying, there's no person too small, springs to mind. The production of this episode of Steam Locos in Profile was thanks in part to the efforts of all volunteers and staff past and present of the Kent and East Sussex Railway. Opened in 1900, this line is now celebrating 60 years of preservation. But like so many heritage railways, the Kent and East Sussex faced major losses during the COVID pandemic, including complete cancellation of their 2020 Santa specials. To help the railway recover from difficult times, please consider donating to their £100,000 COVID appeal at www.kesr.org.uk forward slash donate. And if you'd like to find out more about the railway's resident terriers, visit www.terriertrust.org.uk. Since January 2012, Steam Locos in Profile has been showcasing preserved steam engines around the world. We look at all types from express passenger and suburban stoppers to heavy freight and industrial types. From heritage lines to mainline rail tours, from standard gauge to narrow gauge, from the grouping to the big four and BR, with steam action filmed around the UK and in continental Europe. 
Steam Locos in Profile, available on DVD and digital download from egmedia.co.uk forward slash shop. So there we were, pretty much at midnight by this point, after a four day drive, and I was just thinking to myself, all right, who started World War III now? Hello everybody, I'm Chris Eden Green, and this is the We Are Rail Fans Virtual Festival. Well, Steam Locos in Profile is a magazine style review show that I've been doing on YouTube for the best part of nine years now. I've been making it for the best part of 11 goes back that far. You can imagine it as like Top Gear but with steam locomotives where we review locos class by class, type by type sort of thing. So we give a brief rundown of their concept and their history. Uh, so we, look about their, we talk about their good points and bad points. We show their decline in the 1960s and their revival in preservation and the sort of role that they play in the world of railway preservation today. So fans have sort of likened it to Top Gear down the years but it's more about the locomotives and the subject matter than it is about the presenters falling over, catching fire and upsetting the Mexicans every other week. It's funny because my parents were never interested in steam. I'm the only member of my family who's been um, that sort of keen on the railways. I think my sister was keen on steam for a very short while, but she was very young, but then she quickly moved on to other things. My mother tells me a really weird story like um, Two weeks before I was born, she took my sister to see Mallard coming through our, our local station. I was born in Harrogate. And uh, it was in that brief two year stint when Mallard was actually in operation. And she recounts that as the, as the exhaust got into her, it in turn got to me and that's how I caught the bug. We lived fairly close to the National Railway Museum anyway, so we used to go on out there on, uh, on days out. And then we moved down to the southeast of England when I was about four, let's say four years old, and from there we would visit the Kenton East Sussex and the Bluebell and other places nearby to here, so it just sort of stemmed from there. When it all began sort of towards, um, towards the end of my teens and the start of my twenties, when friends of mine and I, we used to go on holiday together to places like North Wales and the northeast of England and the Isle of Man and Devon and so on, and we'd try and visit as many um, railways in that area as possible in the space of a week um, and one of the things we used to do was like video documentary diaries of our adventures it was nothing fancy it was just a case of waving the camera in front of anything that moved and our, our antics surrounding them but they were fun times really fun times and uh, after that I started watching uh, stuff that was on the television at the time like uh, Tom Ingalls' film about Tornado and Railway Walks with Julia Bradbury and so on and so forth. And then correlating that with stuff that was uh, made sort of directed video, like the um, Castle video series and Railway Roundabout and so on. And as good as all of that stuff was, there was nothing in my mind that correlated um, uh, really good cinematography and editing with all of the information about locomotives. It was sort of half one or half the other. And then I saw Top Gear Racing Tornado to, um, from London to Scotland in 2009, and I thought, see, this is how you do it. This is how you make steam engines look exciting. Why can't, um, why can't rail fans have something like that? And being the foolhardy idiot that I am, I, I took it on myself to try and have a go at it at uh, such a show. So um, in 2010, 2010, I gave up my job as an engineer and took up filmmaking for a living. Pretty much everything, if, if that is a role. A lot of people think that I just present the show and do all the voiceover, but there's a lot more to it than that. So I do all of the writing and the researching. I do most of the filming. I do the editing. I do the presenting of the voiceover. I do the music. You know, a lot of the music I do myself, because um, I think it's important to keep as, as much of it as self-contained as possible. Otherwise, you're just, um, you're recruiting people who you can't afford to pay and that just adds to the whole problem of um, uh, people in the film industry who, who get relied on but don't get paid for it, and I think that's wrong. Um, and also because it proves the point that you don't necessarily need the biggest budget and the biggest crew to make um, a show that's at least watchable. You can make cartoons in your shed uh, at a budget of nothing, like Oliver Postgate and Peter Furman did, or you can be Hollywood and make something like The Lone Ranger. You decide which is better. 
Um, I do have two really good friends who help me out with various bits of camera work and other um, plans, uh, other planning of other shoots and so on. Like when we're doing something really big, like something overseas, and they're really good in that respect. So, cheers, lads. Um, recently, my girlfriend's also gotten involved, and that's been a big help. Um, but most of it, I try to do myself. It can take anything from 18 months to, so far, eight and a half years and counting. <laughs> it just takes that long to get the rushes together. The trouble is, because we make um, so many of the films at once, we don't sort of focus on one class and then move on to the next one once we finish the first one and so on and so forth. We, we do a, sort of little, a little bit of everything at once and so it's a huge juggling act over what's running, where it's running, when it's running, how easy it is for us to get to it and whether or not we can afford to get to it, you know. And it all depends on, on locomotives which we don't have control of not breaking down. So it all, a lot of plans end up changing at the last minute as a result. So fun times. It literally takes me all over the place, you know. In a two week stint I could be in the Cotswolds one day, then in the southwest the next day, then in Scotland the next, then in the northeast, then in Norfolk, then back in the southwest, then in Eastleigh for a, um, ten days or so. And yeah, it just takes us all over the place. It has also taken us to continental Europe a couple of times. So in 2014 we did a special on a trio of locos in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland. In 2017, we all went out to Germany for about two weeks to make some specials on the Kriegslot 210s and on the Hartz Mountain 210s. 2019, I went out to Poland for 10 or 11 days to make a special on the OL 49s out in Volstead. That was good fun. Um, yeah, it's one big road trip, really. difficult really because they've all got their own strengths and weaknesses just like the locos that featured. Um, I suppose the most interesting I've found at least researching one has been the Royal Scots because when you consider that in 1927 the LMS had inherited a load of underpowered Midland types and a load of Northwestern types and subsequent other types which were not made LMS standards because the um, Midland LMS management was mostly formed of Midland people. So you've got a load of small ballplane hammers being used and then all of a sudden Henry Fowler comes up with this sledgehammer of a design and it's like going from naught to 100 miles an hour in five seconds. The Britannia took just over four years to make and at the time that was the worst one but looking back at it it's not the worst one that I feel I've produced it's aged a little bit better than I thought it would. I think the worst one that's aged is probably the castles because um, that took about three attempts to get the pieces to camera rise. You know, I, at first I thought I could get away with using a cheap radio microphone to do the presenting bits. It turned out to be no good. Then I had to go back and try again with a better microphone. The interior at Swindon Steam Museum was fairly badly lit, so the shots didn't come out that great. So I tried again and they still didn't come out that great. So I thought, okay, I'll just piece these all together and see what I can do. And it's okay, I guess. It's not something I would go back and remake, but it's just something I would leave alone. I don't really like the George Lucas way of filmmaking, you know, once you've done something and people are familiar enough with it, you should just, just as well leave well enough alone. If I was in the position to do so, I, I would have liked to have saved the Padon railway system. Because that was interesting in its own, in its own way, because you got um, a network of two foot and four foot gauge stuff, interchangeable with transporter wagons. You got slate mining all around you. It's just steeped in atmosphere. I wish that something could have done to, uh, to help save more of that. I've always had fond memories of the Strad Valley Woodlands Railway. You know, I wasn't expecting those guys to just take us in and welcome us with open arms, but that was, that was a really fun shoot. Um, Volstin was also a really special place because that's like, it's almost like being at Lostock Hall or Carnforth in the very dying days of steam and you've got two Black Fives and the equivalent of Oliver Cromwell doing the last steam hall passenger service in Europe. And yeah, that's just fascinating. So when we went out to Germany, uh, we got to our place in the Hartz Mountains after a four day drive 
Um, we stopped off for two days in the Netherlands, but it was a long old drive. And we settled down to watch The Great Escape, as you're a Brit when you're in Germany, but mostly because Adam hadn't seen it before. And anyone who's seen The Great Escape will know that, will know how it ends. You know, it ends with all of the actors looking slightly off camera, just like that. There's no sound effects, there's no dialogue, it's just the music being played in the background. And on this occasion, uh, there was a sound that went off with the music and the actors. It was a World War II air raid siren, a German World War II air raid siren. And we thought at first that it was the DVD, so Sam paused it. And the music stopped, the film stopped, but the siren didn't. And we discovered then it was coming from outside. We learned about two hours later that it was the emergency siren from nearby um, just undergoing testing, you know, should there be an avalanche or a flood or should the village we were staying in be cut off for any reason. But the reason why we were so nervous about it going off was because earlier in that day, North Korea had launched a test missile going out over the Pacific Ocean towards America. So there we were pretty much at midnight by this point, after a four day drive, and I was just thinking to myself, all right, who started World War III now? Not so much worst location, I'd say the worst journey that I've had coming off of a shoot was um, 2013 when I'd visited the East Lanx Railway for, for their 1T57 weekend in 2013 and I missed the last train back to, back to London from Manchester because there was a rail replacement bus service between the East Lanx and Manchester Piccadilly and so I didn't have any money for a hotel that night, so I had to take a train out to some relatives of mine who lived in the Peak District. And it was 11 o'clock at night, there'd just been a football match, so the train was rammed with drunk football fans. And so I was the only sober one on the train. Don't know why I was the only sober one on the train still to this day. And it was horrible as well. And I suppose in a way that kind of cemented my hatred of the Pacers as well, because it was a Pacer I was riding on and they're awful things. I didn't like them at all. I suppose what I would do, and this is one that wouldn't upset anybody, is if I could extend my garden railway from nothing into something. Well, the, the dream, I suppose, has always been America, because there's so much stuff out there that's just begging to be covered. Um, Australia's another one, India's another one but it all depends on the finances really and how much people actually want it to happen. You know, I've looked into America every year for the last, since 2015, and every time I do, the prices jump up by about 2,000 pounds. So, yeah, it was something I would love to happen, but a lot, of, a lot of things would have to fall in place for it to happen really.